Well, hello everyone. I hope you're doing well and you're safe where you stay. Um, we're going to just let people roll in. I get it that we're slowly opening back up in the world. And so no telling how people are rolling. Um, I personally don't think people were staying home anyway, because every place I went has been packed and busy and I've had to avoid a lot of spaces, but um, so I really don't think people were really um, staying home in the past week anyway. But with that said, I think now more than ever, having the conversation around social determinants of health, we're seeing the impact of where we live, work and play, and even systemic racism has on uh, certain communities. Um, and so as you do your work, it's very important that you put into play um, and into your programming and having an understanding that where a person lives has a lot of times a greater impact on their health outcomes than um, gene genetics. Um, but I think that so the conversation just needs to be had. And so that um, I thought this was important. The other two cohorts did not get this uh, presentation. Um, and so this is an added workshop that I thought was really important. And so she'll be coming, this has done a lot of great work with LISC and works closely with me on some other projects. I invited her to come and just have this conversation to do a presentation, but also engage you all in how you're going to approach social determinants of health in your food related projects. Um, and like I said, with COVID, COVID is gonna change a lot of things in the way that we look at, actually in a way for the good. I think we're looking at health in a different kind of lens with, with all of this, but um, I think it's important that we have this conversation. And so I really want you guys to engage with her um, on the topic and think about how you're going to address social determinants of health or think about it in your food project. So, you know, mute all of your mics, but, you know, I know Shelby's going to really try to engage you. I got to go because my dog just ran out the door with my grandson chasing after her. So without further ado, <laughs> Mimi is gone. She just took off <laughs> with a mere following. So Shelby, if you could just take, her and take over. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Rhonda. So I had a chance to pop in last week and hear each of your introductions of who you are and the work that you're doing um, with the neighborhood food builders. And um, I'm excited about the projects that you um, are considering and um, really, I think the impact that you will have on for yourself and for those in your sphere of influence, whether it's neighbors or other businesses or people in the food community, I'm super excited about the work that you're doing. Before we dive into content, I just feel very compelled to, um, our community has experienced a lot of loss of life as of late, uh, last couple days in precious lives. And so I would like just to take a minute, if we can just have a moment of silence and think of those who are lost and the hurt that you all might be experiencing as we have that collective grieving, um, I would love to do that. Just a few seconds of silence, please. Thank you. So I'm going to do um, a screen share and I love to do face-to-face. -face. Those of you that have used your video feature, I see a couple of you who have, but we're, it's gonna be a lot of content. So this will be um, some information, but a lot of um, communication and wanting to hear your feedback and, and thoughts. Some of what I'm sharing is might not be um, new to you. It might be something that you're very familiar with, and then some of it might be how it connects together might actually be some information that you might not have put together the same way. Um, I know as we are um, experiencing COVID and looking at the impact that um, the virus has 
on different communities, different geographies, different demographics. I think what we're exploring tonight is definitely going to have some explanation as to why some of that happens. Um, I certainly do not believe that in this time period that I can exhaust this particular topic. Um, social determinants um, is very vast. And so um, please, what I might have not covered, please don't think it's less important or anything like that. There's, there's only a certain amount of time that we can cover this and it, hopefully it stimulates conversation and an exploration that you can do on your own um, moving forward. So with that, I'm gonna share my screen here and go through a PowerPoint. But even though we're on a PowerPoint, please still um, engage. Uh, let's see. All right, can you all see the screen? Yes, no? Yes. Okay, yes. thank you. <laughs> Thanks for the feedback, that's good. All right, yes, so yes. Make sure that we can get in here. All right, are you still seeing it? Okay, so um, who am I? I'm Shelby Cummings. I'm the Social Determinants of Health Officer um, with LISC Indianapolis. We're going to, this isn't um, really as much about LISC as it is the topic of social determinants and health equity. Um, I will take some time to discuss community development and how we engage the social determinants in order to increase quality of life, improve quality of life, um, decrease health inequities, and increase health equity for all residents in the Indianapolis area. So as Rhonda just thought a little bit or presented um, early on in her discussion of this topic, where you live shouldn't determine how long you live, but too often it does. And this piece that I see here at the bottom together, we can help change that. I see each one of you and the role that you play with the project that you're doing or the community building that you're doing or as residents engaging others in um, identifying ways to improve your environment, your social connections, your financial stability. Um, you are part of changing that so that at one point our vision is that that every person, regardless of their zip code, would have the opportunity to live as long and live as well as anybody living in a different zip code. So the social determinants, there's, depending on who you um, engage with, they're going to have these divided into different categories just for ease. Um, I have this, uh, the slide in here and we're going to refer to it you're going to see it multiple times today because we're going to be kind of evaluating each of the social determinants and how it impacts our health um, but here's these are the conditions in which people are born they grow live work and age so it is your economic social and built environment as well as your political area that influences it's, con it's based upon the distribution of money power resources at global, national, and local levels. And so please know that this absolutely addresses social determinants, um, any power uh, differences and differential that exist in our communities from systems and policies um, based upon gender, sexual orientation, age, ethnicity, race, um, is part of the social determinants. So um, sometimes we think in very physical realms, but policy and advocacy is a big part of determining health equity um, through the social determinants. So why do these social determinants matter? So for the longest time, um, we had the health community, so public health and um, health institutions, hospitals, clinics, we're talking about personal responsibility and change your behavior and take these meds and your, uh, your uh, genetics. Those are the things that had the greatest impact. If you just ate well enough and you exercised enough and took the medicine that we prescribed to you and you come and see me often, um, you will be healthy. And then research has really shown that about 80% of what determines a person's length and quality of life happens outside of the clinical setting. So we see the health outcomes at the top of this graph, health factors, and then policies and programs. So how the policies and programs influence health factors, which influence those health outcomes. 
So right today, we're really going to focus on this 40% area right here, the social and economic factors and the physical environment, really these, this bottom 15 or 50%. Um, again, many times and even some policy is based upon if you just chose well enough, you would be healthy. And so we know that that's no longer true because access to even be able to act upon what's prescribed or fulfill um, uh, healthy behaviors um, isn't always accessible for every resident. So here's the impact, right? So we have our economic stability, employment, income, expenses, debt, medical bills, support, um, this can be actually handed down generationally. So I give an example, the ability to establish credit in order to borrow allows you to purchase a home, go to school. Well, my dad was, had, we didn't have great income, but he had good credit. So I was able to borrow to go to college, not, and then, you know, my neighbor whose parents didn't have access to credit that person didn't have access to the higher education that I did. And so understanding that economic stability is a really important piece um, to health outcomes. Neighborhood and physical environment. So do you have a healthy space, consistent space to live that is free of environmental dangers, pollutants, um, uh, transportation? Public transit, does that work for everybody? Do you have a car? Do you have another way to get from where you live to where you work? Safety, parks, playgrounds, walkability. Can I, by walking, access uh, and to meet the needs of my family? Education, these things, literacy, language. If English is not your first language, definitely you're going to have um, lower health um, in a community that speaks English um, as the primary language. Early childhood education, that imprinting year. is really key. Um, just uh, an aside, um, the environmental Hold on, my internet says it's unstable. If you can't hear me, let me know. There we go. Um, housing. So if you have lead in your house, if your child consumes some of that um, and has high blood lead levels, it will impact this early childhood brain development, the ability to absorb nutrients. It will impact, impact vocational training, higher education. Are also contributors to health. Is everybody good? Are we okay? Okay. All right. So here's food, hunger, access to healthy options. So really, food falls into food access, food economy, and um, food insecurity, and we address those differently. And so you guys are in that wheelhouse, that space of influencing health outcomes. Um, so right now in our crisis situation, we are stabilizing families that are food insecure through family food boxes. Um, but we also want to be continuing to build that infrastructure for food access um, as we believe that we are going to come through this um, virus and crisis in order to for families to restabilize and then have access to healthy foods moving forward community and social context. Sometimes we often forget social capital. The importance of relationship is foundational to health outcomes and health equity. So way back when I was in college and studying um, health promotion and public health, you know, we talked about exercise. You know, if you do it with a partner, you're more likely to adhere to a program or activity. Well, that was just the very beginning of research that shows that relationship, not just that you have a partner to do those things, but simply that you have someone to share life with, someone to do life with, someone you can reach out to in a situation where you have a need. And so social capital community context is really incredibly important. Um, addressing discrimination in that area um, having a voice in your neighborhood to push against those systems that leaves um, specific um, demographics and geographies oppressed. 
And so having a group of people with a united voice to push against those systems is really incredibly important to health equity. And then at the healthcare system. So do you have health care coverage? Do you have the ability and provider availability? Is there a clinic that's in close proximity to where you live or where you work? Um, provider bias. So we're seeing more and more about institutional racism that exists in the hospital and healthcare systems that don't allow you to get the same treatment a white person going in as compared to an African, African American, Latino, or a non English speaker. Um, there is uh, something that even we've even seen um, providers um, who come from uh, ethnicities um, that traditionally don't get that good treatment because of this privileged um, experience that they've had. Um, often they still miss the point of there are accessibility issues that exist in um, low income neighborhoods. And so reminding and, and, and setting up education at the residency level to understand um, the exploration of implicit bias, as well as the exploration of economic groups that are different than the physicians providing care. It's a super important piece that if you feel like you can go to your primary care or to a hospital or healthcare setting and you're understood and um, appreciated for your particular life experience, you're more likely to access that care. Um, and then the quality of the care, and that's part of, of what I just discussed there. So we're going to present right here, and this is a time for you to give me some feedback, so if you can all chime in. So we're comparing Jess, age 50, on the left, and then Jess, age 50, on the right. And so you can see intervene, medium priority, intervene, high priority, and you see these differences. So where might Jess live on this left-hand side with diabetes and slight asthma, diabetes, chronic disease, slight asthma? Um, kind of share a little bit of your thoughts, diabetes on the right, diabetes, slight asthma. So the exact same diagnosis, the exact same age, she's female, but Jess on the right is a high priority because she's socially isolated, she has unstable housing, and she lives in a high crime neighborhood. Why do you think that Jess is a higher priority of care than Jess on the left? Maybe simply because, hello? Go ahead. Maybe simply because uh, with the social isolation, as our President Trump mentioned, through COVID-19 depression, that can have a lot to, and even suicide, Yes. Saying that uh, her health, especially uh, upper respiratory problems and things like that. Right. I would, uh, I would also see that she may not be, um, can get to foods as well as the things that she needs to, to be placed in a better, have a better life, quality of life. Right. Um, hello? Mm hmm Hi guys. Hello everybody. Hi. It's Liz. Hi. Okay. I can't see the picture, but I have an opinion. And in my opinion, the person that's in the um, neighborhood where it's not such a great neighborhood, nine times out of 10, most of those people don't go to get the care. They don't make the doctor's appointments. They don't um, do follow-ups, even if they have an initial visit for maybe fear or um, lack of resources or transportation or whatever to get to and from the doctor and poor quality of um, food. Like most of those neighborhoods have convenience stores where they don't have the healthy choices. So a lot of the environmental issues and food insecurities that we are seeing today in a lot of our um, not so affluent neighborhoods is what may have affected this person. Yes. Yep. Think about, so in order to manage diabetes, it's exercise, sometimes it's medication, it's um, healthy food and diet, uh, diet and exercise, both of those things. Um, but also, so consider if she doesn't have stable housing, 
what do you think she's going to be giving her time and attention and resources to as compared to going out and getting a healthy walk in unless she's walking where she needs to go to get something or I need, you know, I need my five a day for my diabetes, but um, I live in a high crime neighborhood and I don't have a place to sleep tonight. Where's her focus going to go? Her focus is going to be first on securing like basic shelter, probably Maybe like getting food for the day. Um, that sort of thing versus like, it's like if you got to prioritize your to-do list or you're on your hierarchy of needs, going yep. to visit a doctor for preventative care or even for like uh, acute care is going to be lower than making sure that you have a safe way of getting there, a safe place to stay or food to fuel your, your or give yourself energy to do all that. Right. Yep. And then looking at the socially isolated piece of that, that could be because of domestic violence. It could be because of depression and the diabetes. So it's usually when someone's diagnosed with diabetes, there's significant behavior change that really is prescribed for that individual, but she's feeling sad, maybe depressed, feeling hopeless. Perhaps no matter how hard she tries, she can't make a difference. So she might feel helpless in that situation. And so that social isolation that could come from multiple sources, there's no one to reach out to her, to encourage her. And so it's really super important um, to, to see the impact of that social isolation on her outcome. So I also see these areas where you have the green and the yellow and the red, so the high priority. Um, health institutions and insurers also see this is where the dollars go. And so they're not always excited about that. And yet we see that a little bit of investment in these social determinants really decreases the cost of care in the clinical setting. And we'll talk about how health institutions are now shifting their focus to do some investment outside of the walls of the hospital or clinic. So we're gonna um, go through this. So while I go through these, be thinking of where you live or a story or a neighborhood that you might be familiar with where you can share where you've seen some of these impacts on health. So looking first at um, the connection between affordable housing and health, right? Um, so affordable housing, people are like, oh, what does that mean? It, affordable housing by definition is housing where somebody who earns what's 30 to 80% of the area median income um, in uh, a certain area, and that's determined by averages, that there is housing that would be 30% of the 30 to 80% of area median income. So we would want our housing costs to be at that level. Um, Indianapolis has a horrible affordable housing um, market where 52 or, um, I think 64% of residents pay 52% of their household income to housing costs. So when you have a situation like that and your car breaks down, then it's a choice between do I pay my rent or my mortgage or do I fix my car so I can get to work because that cost is so high. So let's look, poor housing quality and indoor air impacts respiratory health. Anybody hear about that, experience that, know about that? This is Tequila. Yeah. I, um, I work with the um, this place that are usually at Motor Aid or Motel 6 Office 37th and Shalen. And so I see that a lot. Most of them are paying almost $800 a month to stay at this motel from week to week uh, because of um, various reasons. Right. But in those hotels, of course, and, and a lot of people know the uh, demographics and the condition of those motels, they do because there's mold in those rooms. So if they have asthma, if they have uh, respiratory issues, they're, they're not getting proper air. There's, they're limited on uh, the, the spacing that's in those rooms. So everything is crowded up into this one room. And so that also impacts their health. So I definitely see that I have some that have diabetes and uh, not being able to get out and exercise because they're in this area. But the crime rate is so high also that they don't feel safe to be able to get out and do some of those positive things that they could be doing because of where they stay. So definitely seeing how that affects uh, 
their health. Yeah. Yeah, it is a real issue. And so we are looking at how pollutants um, do impact. We do know that it contributes to chronic disease, but also the stress of housing instability impacts immune functionality. So we have um, inflammation sit processes that help with the fight or flight response, but we shouldn't live like that in that fight or flight stage every day. But when you're housing insecure, um, that is really where we stay, which then causes inflammation, chronic disease um, increase and in, in impacts chronic disease um, incidence. And then homelessness affects all physical and mental facets of health and often results in high emergency department or emergency room utilization. Basically, uh, so I will tell you, um, uh, I live in an area where there's a, a significant um, number of individuals experiencing homelessness and um, we know how infectious COVID-19 is um, and yet they were licking parking meters because they wanted to get sick in order to be able to go to the hospital to have housing in the situation and um, to, to see that desperation um, is really heartbreaking. Um, so we we'll see higher use of emergency room utilization. I hear someone talking. Someone, someone have something to say? I don't want to miss, miss your words. Yeah, what neighborhood do you live in? And what area? <laughs> yeah, I live actually. If that's, live, actually, if that's confidential, ahead. it's, you know, understood. No, no, I have no problem sharing. So I actually live in Miles Square. I live in downtown so that I can walk to work. Um, but our community, particularly right across the street, and it's one of my favorite places to be, um, is, is a park where um, I'm really thankful that the, the city has really preserved an area for individuals experiencing homelessness to sometimes sleep, to hang out, to come and have um, meals served. And um, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a, a dichotomy, I have to tell you, where you see that on one side of the street and the other side, you see the healthy um, white um, upper middle class um, professionals exercising, just a, a street right between the two things happening. And so it's, it's um, a really sad um, image for sure. All right, so health and education. Um, how many of you thought, man, I'm gonna be so healthy when I'm in my adult years because I went to school, <laughs> I went to class. Anybody think that way? Do y'all get excited? I'm gonna be healthy because I'm showing up every day. Um, here's where there's a connection. It impacts lifestyle and health decisions. So if you're able to understand the information that your physician who often will not break down that health information for you to understand, if you're able to understand that, you're able to respond to it, but also access to education as a child increases financial stability and improves overall wellness through adulthood. So that early childhood education piece is incredibly important. And then workforce development and adult education have the same impacts and it lowers recidivism for those who have an education and are able to engage in healthy choices um, and to leverage their education to overcome barriers from being engaged with the um, criminal justice system. Um, they're going to have better health outcomes. Any thoughts on the relationship between health and education? I have a uh, thought about what you said pertaining to uh, a lot of homeless people on uh -huh. the streets. Um, do you have any knowledge pertaining to how to reach out to them and, you know, help them uh, with the uh, with the service that all of us do? Yeah, so we can talk a little bit more about that, but there are um, community groups that continue, and, and I actually am really amazed. So um, what a tragic day our community experienced multiple times with the loss of life, and my husband was down taking the dog out, and um, he said, Shelby, I saw something that was really moving. There was a man experiencing homelessness, a, a white man experiencing homelessness sleeping on the bench, and there were four African-American young people who got out of the car and brought a box of food 
to share with him. And um, we have seen more of that rather than those organizations that traditionally have been doing it Sunday nights and Wednesday nights. We're seeing other community groups, whether it's churches or I, I'm not sure exactly where they all come from, but have just really been coming down and serving them specifically, um, reaching out for sure. So the work that you do specific, um, specifically like engaging with your farmer's market or, you know, finding if you have any reserves in your food or uh, any, any portion of your work that you could set aside in order to engage with an organization that's serving really what we support often um, is to say what organization is already serving a particular community and how can you engage and enhance their work um, so to continue to work in collaboration with the work that's already being done. So that's a great question. All right, so financial stability and health. So I will tell you, I am pretty biased in the area in the way of, of all these social determinants, which one really has the greatest impact. And I would say um, the ability to earn and save money. So a livable wage is really, um, in my mind, it's my opinion <laughs> that a, a, a well-paying job where, like I said, where you can earn, pay your bills and save, accumulate an asset is really where you're having the greatest health outcomes. So healthcare costs can be dramatic. Um, the access to insurance isn't always there for every resident. Um, and then what does that look like when individuals and families have financial stability, they're spending on healthy foods and health goes up. Right, so if you're not having to spend all of your money on the $800 a week, or $800 a month for uh, housing, $800 a week, that'd be a lot, wouldn't it? Um, $800 a month on housing, then you can buy those healthier foods. Um, again, none of this is rocket science to, to many of us who have lived in environments where access to things are not um, as available as in other neighborhoods. It does impact health and wellness, diabetes, hypertension, and, and other chronic diseases. Can I say something to that? I would love to hear your comments for sure. Okay. Um, so I, I work at a nonprofit and I've been there for about three years. And the first year I was there, I was an AmeriCorps member through the Public Allies Program. Yep. So my insurance was covered through them and I didn't have like a monthly premium. Pretty much everything that I needed was, was covered through the insurance um, as far as, you know, my, my public service through that program. Yep. After that was over, I got into our health insurance program at work. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that has been really difficult for me is that, you know, I, you know, I, I earn a, you know, a livable wage. Um, but even, and even with healthcare, I cannot afford to still get adequate care right now. And so it's gotten to the point where I have to be very, like, just aware of what it is that I'm going to see the doctor for and um, calling ahead of time to get pricing information mm -hmm. and understand how that's going to, you know, be built back to the insurance and if it's going to be a covered cost. Yeah. And what I have found out, which is really, really sad, but I would probably be better off not having insurance. Yeah than having insurance because when I've called places and I've asked like what the, what the price for this service would be because you have to get the billing codes. What I found is that a lot of the times they're quoting me prices without insurance. Right. <laughs> and I said, well, why is it so much more? Well, that was the price if you didn't have insurance, but yeah. because you have insurance, this yeah. is actually what the cost is going to be. And it's up for, between you and your insured to determine how much of that cost they're going to pay and how much of it you're going to pay. Yep. Yes. So it's, you know, even beyond what we call the benefits cliff, where you have somebody that might have public assistance or government funded assistance, whether it's for food or access to health care, and then they begin earning a wage that is enough to have or have an employer sponsored um, insurance, but the deductibles and the co-pays and the premiums that are often had to pay the net gain, it, it, there's a net loss to that household income. And so um, 
oftentimes people then will elect, I will take a job that is less pay in order for me to maintain my government sponsored insurance. And it is a tragedy because it has significant impact on health outcomes for sure. So um, I hear what you're saying. It's a, it's a, a sad um, reality for sure. So social cohesion, we talked about this. I'm gonna hit it hard again. We don't measure this well. So oftentimes we're like, how do we know? This is a hard area to measure to go. If we invest in social impact or social cohesion, like arts and culture, um, events and activities where people come together to build relationship, block parties, art on the wall, things like that where the people come together. Um, how do we know that, that the health impact is related to that? And often, if you look here, social isolation is, accounts for decreased immune functionality, increases disease rates, including mental illness, um, notable depression, linked to high suicide rates as well. And we have seen suicide rates um, escalate um, and uh, mental illness diagnoses escalate, not just because we're better at diagnosing them, but because there is um, an increase in, in its instance, not just that it's being diagnosed. And then community connectivity allows for an increase. So this is super important. And, and as we're looking at COVID right now, Community connectivity is one of the foundational pieces of, um, of health and well being. If you can access information, you can make decisions for yourself. And self determination is the foundation for personal growth um, and progress. But if you are isolated from the information that you need to make good decisions for yourself, where does that leave you? Give me feedback. Where does it leave you? If you are, if information is kept from you or you don't have access to information that helps you decide for yourself, who then decides for you? Other people. Other people, right? And how many of you are a fan of other people deciding for you what is best for you? I'm not, I'm not a fan of it. Ask my husband, ask my kids, <laughs> ask my boss. Um, I want the freedom and the flow of information, and we're seeing this now with COVID, when we have um, particular geographies, which also then coincide with um, particular demographics, particu um, particularly those um, that are black and brown residents, they do not have internet access. They might have a device, but they don't have access, or if they have access, they don't have a device in order to leverage information to make choices for themselves. And it increases, so if, if you have access, it increases your access to health and financial stability related resources. So if you didn't have internet access and you lost your job, how do you apply for unemployment? How do you, if you're a small business owner, and how do you apply for a business loan or a grant or the PPP uh, program? There's no way that you can do that. So connectivity is really important, but social cohesion, sharing in the community relationship is key to help. Vibrant neighborhoods, this kind of goes along with that. So you can access amenities. So a park, inviting public spaces, interconnectivity of resources. But this is also the space where the culture of your neighborhood is preserved. And so um, we'll get a little bit more into what LISC does, but we do what is called placemaking. We don't do citywide initiatives. We don't invest in citywide initiatives. We invest in individual neighborhood plans that's resident driven, stakeholder informed, and that the neighborhoods, we believe that the neighborhoods where we're investing have the right to decide for themselves what is the DNA, what is the culture of that neighborhood. And it allows people to connect to one another um, in these vibrant neighborhoods. So it's also having amenities like healthcare, maintaining health behavior, because you have healthcare in the area, you have parks. Um, you also have jobs and economic development for a neighborhood to support financial stability. All right, so we're gonna shift just a little bit. Now we've talked about the social determinants. Any questions that we have to this, this point? Any questions about social determinants? Do we all agree that there are things that exist um, in our communities, in our environment that impact our health? Yep, synergy, I'm getting, no one else, I don't see anybody else. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, not convinced. What's up with those chemtrails, though? Yes, yes. no. What's up with the chemtrails? I, I agree with you as well. Awesome. What are your thoughts on chemtrails? I'm not hearing my thoughts on what? Chemtrails. Chemtrails. Chemistry trails across the sky the airplanes leave. Oh, chemtrails. So my husband works in aviation, and yeah, we, yeah, contrails, we, um, I don't know, interesting to look at, I guess, <laughs> for sure. So, the social that's determinants. Say. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> <laughs> so the social determinants, if we were to take a snapshot of where the social determinants currently exist right now, here's one statistic that we'll see um, in the greater Indianapolis area. So within 28 miles, there are 14 years and worlds apart and why. So if you look at the top of this, right here. Um, we see up in the Carmel 46033 zip code, um, the average life expectancy is 83.7 years and then 14 years less, you see down in the southeastern district of 69.4 years. Um, this is a tragedy that where you live determines how long you live. That is not just genetics, it is access, it is um, it is social connectivity, it is education, um, so many things, all these social determinants, that is the biggest difference in these areas, public safety. Another challenge that Indianapolis, as the social determinants currently exist, with no change in them, we also see there's a lack of economic mobility. So you can see that Indianapolis is one of the 10 worst cities, great award for us to have, unfortunately, it's, it's not, uh, in America where when it comes to economic mobility, which means a person born in Indianapolis is more likely to stay poor than if he or she was born in a different area. So look at the other cities that were compared to. So, you, the likelihood of you, if you're born in the lower 20%, which is considered the poverty bracket, if you're born into poverty in Indianapolis, only 4.8% of those born in that lower 20% actually make it to the top 20%. So look, we're being compared to Chicago, Boston, Washington, mm. D.C., Charlotte, Atlanta, Salt Lake City, San Jose, Denver. We're one of the lowest. Um, so this is a tragedy that the ability to move out of poverty, now you can move to the next one or the next one up, but the likelihood of going from the lower 20% to the top 20% were one of the worst in the United States. What are your thoughts about I, that? I actually that... noticed, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Okay. I actually noticed that even in grocery stores, grocery stores in that those neighborhoods, the produce, meats, po um, 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 milk, cheese, dairy, dairy, everything is so much higher, not so, so, so much higher, but it's a lot higher in those neighborhoods than it is in the Carmel areas, Noblesville, other areas. And the quality is what it's not as good. It's not a um, the the fruits and, and vegetables or um, they go bad quicker or they're not very good when they come in on the truck. And I noticed the streets in the neighborhoods. We have access to I think more dollars than those neighborhoods do because they have their own economies. We have access to more dollars. But the streets in those neighborhoods have more chuck holes. They're not as smooth. They don't um, get the quality um, materials repaving that the other neighborhoods do. The libraries in our neighborhoods, except for the downtown library, are not as equipped, not as new, don't have the same amenities as the other libraries in other areas. Um, around our city. I noticed that those areas are slighted, just like you mentioned, mm -hmm. of a lot of um, economic um, or uh, equal, equal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> equity. 
equity or social determinants. I, yep. It's not fair. It's so, unfair because. Yeah. And we call it, so, you know, we all kind of go, what do we say if it's a neighborhood that we ourselves might not be living in and we don't want to be disparaging to a neighborhood that has challenges. So as an investment, um, so we're a community development financial institution, we consider the neighborhoods where we are doing work as disinvested neighborhoods where there has not been um, an investment that brings amenities. Now, certainly we'll get to a space if we have time today um, where we talk about as we invest, we also have to be aware of being strategic about maintaining the current re um, residency that exists and maintaining affordable housing in the process so that we are not pushing those um, with that investment who have been in the neighborhoods for generations out because our city has um, a very horrible history of gentrification happening. So do know that we think about that and that's why we really go off of the resident led, the resident developed plans when we look at our investment. In the I have a quick, um, yeah, go ahead. I had an observation about this map and I know um, Liz, at least I don't know if anyone else can't see it. So I wanted to comment on um, or just point out that if you look at the map and the areas in red that have the um, lowest uh, economic mobility, you'll see the biggest cluster of that is like in the deep south area yeah, where slavery, slavery was so, and Jim Crow laws and stuff in that. Um, so a lot of this has been something historically passed down and that also Indianapolis, we're just as red as they are down there. We are, we are. Um, and so honestly, LIS, we're in 38 metropolitan cities throughout the United States, but where we're growing and putting more field offices is that the south, um, southeastern part of the United States because it's where poverty exists the most. We do not apologize for investing in geographies or demographics that aren't where the need is not met by government entities or other investments. We are thrilled to be saying who is being left out of the, the impact of some of our other systems to say we're going to invest in those and we're going to get into a little bit about that. All right, here's um, the last one. One thing that I wanted to say, ask is do you, because Indi Indianapolis is also, I believe, um, either in the top 10 or just like just out of the top 10 as far as um, most segregated yeah. cities goes. Yeah. Um, and our history of segregation is, is more recent yes. than a lot of other cities. Um, I think IPS was sued about segregating their schools in like 1972 yeah. or something like that. So yeah. um, I don't, does, does that map pretty closely? Yeah, and yeah, segregation is a big piece of it. Um, and Indianapolis, if I could all encourage you, if you're taking any sort of note or something to pursue additional information, Marion County Public Health Department's Health Equity Report, 2018 Health Equity Report, if you go to their webpage, it's there, you can find the click click on it. So even flipping through the first few pages, they have a lot of um, visual graphics to express um, some statistics that are really heartbreaking, crushing, if you have any ounce of compassion in you. Um, so I encourage you to take a look at that, either electronic form. I have a hard copy of it. Um, the statistics are really hard, but um, the segregation piece and the history, actually reading through at the beginning of it and reading the history of Indianapolis in segregation and racism, um, Jim Crow, um, the pitting of uh, working class white people against African Americans, the, the new Jim Crow, um, and seeing the very slow progress to, uh, and, and I dare, goodness, I'm, I'm even hating using the word progress because I feel like we've been hit pretty hard as of the last few days. Um, so, uh, be sure to take a look and actually this last this graphic right here is the growing racial wealth divide okay so we see um uh in 2000 or 1980 so average this is the hourly wage by race so the top line is our white people and then the bottom line are um 
people of color. So used to earn $24 an hour and now 2015, we were an hourly, uh, average hourly rate, $22 an hour. So it dropped $2 an hour. But then we also see, we see that for people of color, it dropped $3 an hour. And the real reality about this, if you look at the graph on the right, we see that our minority population in Indianapolis is growing. So we have more people earning less <laughs> because of the growth in, um, in ethnicity, uh, uh, black and brown ethnicities in our community. And so it's a challenge. So we're gonna take a little bit. Um, Rhonda, do you guys normally do a little stretch or anything? No, no. So please feel free, get up and move around um, and stretch. And uh, I want to keep you guys are engaging really well. And it is an engaging topic because it impacts all of our lives, right? So wherever we're living, social determinants exist, how well they're invested and available to us for health outcomes, we all experience it. So keep, keep engaging. It's awesome. All right, so now we're going to go through some scenarios, thinking of these social determinants, all right? So here's scenario one. Kelly is a single mom working hard to support a family of three. She works two jobs and relies upon public trans transportation in her daily life. She shares that she struggles with affordability and access to healthy foods for her kids. They also do not like the taste of most vegetables. She regularly buys dinner from fast food restaurants, which are convenient for her and affordable due to a $1 menu. Her primary shopping takes place at the convenience store near her bus stop. So as we go through these scenarios, we're gonna really guard against judgment, but we might have some compassion and be able to identify some challenges that Kelly is facing. So what health or quality of life challenges may exist for this family? Any thoughts? The first thing that really jumped out at me was just, I think time. Time. So if you're working two jobs and you're using public transportation, and if she's in Indianapolis, I'm just going to assume that no matter where these jobs are, <laughs> it's going to take her at least an hour on the bus to get there. Um, so when you're doing that and you have three children to care for or just a, or a family of three in general, I guess I should say, um, that doesn't leave a lot of time to right. focus on prepping. You're tired. You're exhausted. Yep. Anyone else? I don't like to always start with challenges, but I did feel like the flow of the conversation might work best there. I really like to start with assets and we'll get to that. Any other challenges? What about this part? They don't like the taste of most vegetables. So there isn't a culture of eating vegetables in the house. Is that a challenge? I don't know if any, if all of you have tried to feed children who don't like the food you put in front of <laughs> Maybe I'm the only one that had that. Yeah. That's a huge challenge, huge. So many kids are like, ugh, when you serve them. Because I serve kids, especially on the weekends, that are out of school because there's no lunch for them. Yeah. And the first thing they say is they want the meat. Oh, Miss Liz, why you bring us this? We don't eat this. We don't like this. I'm like, what choice did you have? And I can't really say Right. What's really on my mind, because I'm thinking that's, you're going to be older and have illnesses, but I don't say that. I'm like, try it. You know, you never know. You might like it or you could add something to it, you know, tweak it and maybe it'll taste better to you. You know, I, I try to get them to think outside of their norm. The ho-ho, Twinkies, ding-dongs, um, what's the favorite, Takis, you know. Think outside of the junk that you eat every day and try something different. Right. But it's because of that. That's the environment that they're living in, or they're. Um, that's what they eat. That's normally sugar, salt, and fat. Right. I mean, that's what they're used to. So they get right. mad and upset with you if you try to introduce them to something that's bland. <laughs> you know. So that's what I found. Yeah. in most neighborhoods or most children especially 
Yeah, the this last piece right here. So her primary shopping takes place at the convenience store. So it is going to be the bags of chips and it's going to be the ding dongs. And and I sit here and I have tremendous compassion for mom who's short on time, lacks transportation. She's a busy mom. She's working two jobs. She probably didn't have time to build relationship with the neighbor to say, hey, can you watch the kids while I go and do a decent grocery shop? Um, and then the palate of the child is developed based upon what is available. So then when you do introduce, so we're talking about food access and Rhonda hits this one hard. And a, a lot of meetings I've been, she was like, you can give access to healthy foods, but if that is not the habit of that family or that it's not accessible to even cook some of it, knowing how to even prepare some of it um, and make it palatable to some, then it is a challenge to make that shift. Even if she had for some reason, man, she's, she was making $30 an hour now and she gets a car, it's still going to be a challenge to make that shift in the, the dietary habits because we, we have affinity to certain things. Let's move to the next question. Well, actually, Shelby, can I add something really fast? Sure. I think yeah, that first question is something that all the food champions should actually just keep with them as they're coming across families and they're coming across folks that they're working with because the whole purpose of what you're doing is to address some of these help to address some of these challenges and so you have to not just take this on from a very personal passion this is what i want to do food access kind of thing that we all do when we're doing like i want to do this but what how how the, how does the work that i do impact these challenges that this families have because every family is going to have a different challenge yep. so i think accessing uh assessing that with the family is going to do you a lot of good and uh, uh, you know as you're working with families instead of assuming our you know that you kind of know this we have all this data stuff but getting to know the family and their passion and what and what they can feel like they can do and what they can't do and work within that and i think we do have somebody who wants to also say something as well yeah awesome let's hear it um, i did want to say something about that matter <laughs> as it is generational it's because like over the generations you know our uh grandmothers and uh grandparents and uh our parents they used to grow gardens in their backyard and supplement the food that they had and that was a culture for a long time i mean that's where we started from and it's like as generations has gone by the convenient foods have got drawn them away from the uh the healthy foods the vegetables the the fruits and it's uh it's become a generational thing as much as a cultural thing um yeah. and the weird thing is see some other cultures the indian cultures or other cultures that uh, are foreign born they come over and you notice they eat a lot of vegetables automatically in their diet i think that the generational thing has happened we in a in america just in general um that we become so to convenient foods that it's gone now down about two, three generations, and this is all they know. Right, that's a really great point. So um, it is, and I'm glad you brought up the cultural differences, because sometimes, you know, man, we have a tight connection with our culture and who we identify with as, as who we are as an individual with what we eat. So when we go, you know, for Thanksgiving or Cinco de Mayo or Fourth of July, we have specific foods and they're celebration foods, and yet it causes us to be really tied to who we are. And to change that really is like, you're asking me to not be Latino anymore. You're asking me to not be African-American anymore as, as you're asking me to change some of these food choices. So it's good. Rhonda, um, you might see the last question that I have here. How might your um, neighborhood food, food builder project influence the quality of life of this family? So that is that very specific question that I put in each one of these scenarios for you to be thinking this project, how would it help? improve the quality of life for this family or health. So I'm, I'm really dividing both health and quality of life. And um, there might be some things, although I think all of it contributes as we explored before, it contributes to health, health equity, health outcomes, um, but just a general joy and well-being in this project that you're working on or the work that you do in other spaces, how does it impact or influence this particular family? 
Um, these same four questions are on each one of them. So um, I'm not going to go through all of this one just for the sake of time. Let's go to scenario number two, actually. So we did, I'll go to this one. This slide's going to show up again. We're going to identify social determinants that impact. So this next scenario, <coughs> excuse me. Lloyd is a 65 year old man diagnosed with type two diabetes. He is retired and lives alone. In discussion, you have learned that he does not get daily, weekly, or monthly exercise. He does have transportation, but is on a limited monthly income with social security and Medicaid benefits. He lives in a neighborhood where there are few sidewalks or public green spaces. So I'm gonna to jump to this um, question about what social determinants of health influence um, Lloyd's health and quality of life. So I'll come down to this slide. What social determinants influence economic stability, neighborhood and physical environment, education, food, community and social context, healthcare system? Any of those contribute to maybe the challenges that Lloyd has or his quality of life or health or I lack thereof? I'm guessing maybe social connectivity, hmm? possibly. Yep. You know, if he's living alone and if he's not able to connect with other neighbors in his area, um, that could have a, a, a big part of it. And I've, I've noticed that like in certain neighborhoods, like with where I live, I live on the Erie side. So there's, we have neighborhoods that have really good sidewalks and great connectivities and others are not so much like Otterbein neighborhood. They don't have sidewalks and they don't have a lot of front porches and things of that nature. Right. So most of their, most of the residents over there, I've noticed kind of stay inside the house and they're not right. getting out as much. Yep. And that has a great impact on, you know, their health and their mental well being in a lot of ways. Right. So if he's retired, he's no longer working anymore, and he has very limited, he lives alone, limited social action, what do you think his mental well-being might possibly be? He might totally enjoy being in that space by himself, but what might there be a challenge? Potentially, he would be depressed, lonely, um, you know, you don't, in that case, if you're just by yourself, and who do you have to be exercising for, yeah. or, you know, yeah. or making a healthy meal for. Right. So, I and like to go <laughs> along with that, if you don't mind me saying. No, good. So, my grandmother has diabetes, mm -hmm. and... I don't feel as though her healthcare providers give her a lot of support on how movement and dieting and just not, not even necessarily dieting, but just cha like lifestyle changes could improve that. Mm -hmm. And so for him, you know, without like him having like that, that them there to encourage him on doing that, he's not going to probably do it. You know, they're just concerned about giving him medicine just to offset the lifestyle that he, he is on now rather than trying to work with him on changing the lifestyle. Right. That's good. So always believing that we approach life best when we know that we have some strengths or asset, assets to address the challenges in our life. What strengths or assets can Lloyd use to begin a regular habit of physical activity? What might he have available to him that he might be able to have a regular habit to go, here's one thing I have and I'm gonna leverage that to start, get the ball rolling. He has transportation, so if he, um wanted to like go somewhere or find places to hike then he could do that or find places where he can work out uh, yep. that aren't in his house then he can do that right so good anything else right here he has he has a fixed income but he has medicare benefits so he has access to health care he also will have access to um spaces to actually work out you have what is the silver sneakers program and there's programs that are tailored towards seniors especially those who have medicare benefits yep. and so there's some act there's some um 
you know, just linking him up with those programs. And then that will also give him some group support too with other seniors who are also active. So that's one way that, you know, he already has that asset. Yes. Yes. So as you engage with people and um, if your project is food based, um, definitely engage in that space, but also know like, okay, so identifying as people make small steps in their life changes and you can identify, okay, so actually back in the Kelly story, man, this woman has some determination. She's working two jobs. She's probably tired as all get out for sure, but there is something in her that keeps her driving and trying and putting forth and to, to see that asset and strengthen to approach people that way, really one, extends dignity and two, prevents you from approaching somebody from a space of pity, right? So go, okay, what strengths exist there? And how do we start with that to make maybe one little change in that it's, it's what you present, but then that power, you're presenting the information, but the power shift is that person makes the decision, self-determination again. But sometimes they need the encouragement to go, you have some things that you can use in order to make that small step that you might want to make. All right, so here's another question. How might your um, neighborhood food builder project influence the quality of life of Lloyd? I think if uh, with, our, with a project providing him with other resources that might uh, uh, free up some of his income to be able to have more, per se, gas money to get some to some other things on a weekly or monthly basis because now he we provide an, um food at a more uh, economical, you know, cost or even free. So that allows him to have some access to, to more of his re income resources. Yes. How many of you are considering maybe um, neighborhood or urban gardens or farming? I was going to say, this dude needs a garden. <laughs> he like, does. <laughs> he needs to get active. He has type 2 diabetes. Yes. Um, he needs people to talk to. Like yes. all of those things come from gardening like yes. build this man a garden put the, yes. put the beds at like waist higher higher so that he doesn't have to bend down and he can walk through his garden yes yes or he does it with a young kid who bends down to do some of it and he gets to be you know in, in these upper levels yes that as i was writing this scenario i was like and this a garden would be fantastic inviting him he has transportation he can go to a community garden outside of his neighborhood you know, and that physical, so that's why I put physical activity. It didn't have to be like, ooh, I got my heart rate up to 80% of my age predicted maximum heart rate, blah, blah, blah. It's, he got out and he moved and he bent over and he stretched and he dug and he sweat and um, it's good. Awesome. All right. Here's another scenario. Well, actually to add to that, I think he needs some companionship because talking to people, especially when you're alone, a lonely type of person. I find that seniors just need uh, somebody to just, you know, they can count on you to come by every once in a while and you can talk to them or you can do things with them. They really enjoy that a lot and it makes them more active. That's right. That's right. And speaking, referring back to the comment about generational differences and reflecting, like, yeah, he might have done that as a child and it might be really great reflection and remembrance on, on where he's been in his past. All right, we have two more scenarios. Um, so a young couple um, have recently, and this might resonate with some of you, um, a young couple have uh, recently had their first child. They're, they own their own business that was thriving until a recent economic downturn. We've had that. Um, their business income no longer provides enough income to support the family. They are behind on rent and struggle to pay utilities and buy food. The couple cannot afford private insurance and they do not qualify, sorry, I misspelled some of these things, qualify for government funded health care. They do not have access to internet, making it difficult to apply for unemployment or look for work. All right, if you were to, this was a friend that came to you and they said, I need help, I don't even know where to start. Identify life challenges. Think of really, you can pick any of these questions here. What social determinants might be influencing where they are, um, what strengths they might have. Just pick a question and dive in. I'd love to hear you. I mean, one asset is they have a, a, a new baby that is going to be motivating them to 
to find a way to make it work. Yes. One more mouth to feed. <laughs> it can be seen that way as well. Mm -hmm. I think one asset they might have, um, if they're small business owners, they might have some social capital that they could tap into. Yes. Yep. And be what some, go ahead. Although they're, I, I mean, if this were, if I were in this scenario, I would reach out to the temp services. One, the mother can stay at home and dad can go to the temp service. It's a weekly pay. Uh, to get caught up until they can get back on their feet. Since yeah. seeing that they couldn't apply for any any uh, government assistance or anything like that. Right. You know, we're seeing technology as um, a, a utility, a internet as a utility at this point, equal to running water and um, lights, gas, electric and gas. We're seeing it as a utility that actually can be an issue of life or death. And, you know, sometimes we think of Wi-Fi, it's, it's so I can watch my Netflix binge or so I can flip through my Facebook and social media. But internet access brings so much. So right now with kids who are working, coming to school from home, um, and we're not even sure, like, what is the next wave going to come? Is this going to be something that might happen for a while on intermittently, not being able to progress? Remember we're back in that slide about the importance of education and health outcomes. So if you have these major gaps, um, right now we're seeing a prediction from educators that the amount of school, and I hope this doesn't discourage you, the amount of school that's being missed, because normally I think it's, I think 0.3, uh, a third of the year is lost during the summer months. So there's this refresher period. And there's an estimation that an average kid is going to lose two years of education during this gap. And so that's, that's one group of estimations. And so not having access to internet can be, have long-term consequences for education, as well as seniors, man, isolated seniors who can't, who were accustomed to seeing their grandkids or connecting with a neighbor, if they had internet where they can do a video call like what we have right here, the improvement to mental health and connection to human beings, although this is not our favorite, it's better than having nothing. And so right now, um, connection, uh, connectivity with internet um, is a really key piece to be able to then apply for financial resources that are government sponsored that most often are implemented through um, electronic formats. All right, here's our last scenario. L Lucy is a nurse at a regional hospital. She recently completed her master's degree in healthcare administration and was promoted to clinical lead for her department. She purchased her own home and is looking forward to sharing it with her fiance whom she will marry in six months. He has a good job as a technology engineer. She enjoys walking through her neighborhood, biking to the local park, and going to the gym around the corner. Her mom and dad live 20 minutes away, and she looks forward to Sundays when she visits with them to cook a meal together using fresh foods from the local farmer's market. What health or quality of life challenges may exist <laughs> for Lucy? What strengths or assets? Uh, I forgot to change the name here. We'll use to use to meet, um, to meet her needs. I forgot to change these from the first slide, sorry. What social determinants of health influence Lucy's health and quality of life? That one might be the easiest one to answer and how might your neighbor, neighborhood food builder project influence the health or quality of life for Lucy? I think she lives, she lives uh, in walking distance to a, for a local farmer's market. She's a nurse, so she has some uh, background on the importance of eating healthy and uh, making sure that she's watching her cholesterol take or, you know, doing those routine checkups, et cetera. So I think for her, she's at a, an advantage to some um, prerequisites for healthy living and, and a healthy quality of life. 
Do you feel like she lives in a, an invested neighborhood or disinvested neighborhood? Definitely invested. Invested. They have the local I'm able to walk is safe so you know she's in the area where she's with her fam not far from family so uh she doesn't have to worry of being able to get to them in the event that she doesn't have transportation she's happily uh in a re in a healthy relationship so she just has a lot of uh, that are going for her right financially emotionally physically and it makes it so yeah yeah to, to piggyback on to, it's socially too. Everything that she just said, but add the social aspect because she probably has friends. They go to the market or meet at the market on a regular basis whenever the market is there. You know, they may share recipes, other things that makes her quality of life even better. So just what she said, plus the little social part. Yeah. So I put this scenario in here just to show the contrast of how this economic, social, and built environment that Lucy, I tried to pick the most basic white girl name I possibly could. because she probably I was actually going to ask, is she white or non-white? <laughs> Lucy or Megan or Jennifer was where You are was not right for that. You were just so <laughs> wrong for that. No, it's Becky, and you are really wrong for that. I should have said that. That's me. But you, <laughs> you are so funny. I love you. You're so relatable. You really are. You are so, so freaking relatable. Good. good. Thank you. I appreciate. It. I try to be. Um, I try to be real. You are. There's no sense. You are. <laughs> so, so she is. She is. Um, I tried to in, just imply that she was also white, so she doesn't experience the emotional and um, consistent micro traumas of living as a minority in a majority white um, culture. Um, and hey, so, Sophie, I do have a something because yeah. you know I was reading all of that. Maybe just is, is how I think. I thought that she actually has a stressful life. Like I thought, I was like, that's just a whole lot. I don't want to do all that. But the difference is that she does have these areas of access. Yeah. Like, I was like, I don't want to be a nurse. I don't want to complete a master's degree. And then the baby and a husband, I got to go cook for my parents. And that sounds like a, a lot. I just, but I kept going, God, I don't want to do that. That sounds stressful. But she has the access, the way yes. to relieve that stress. Yes. That's there. So that's kind of how I took it with, I felt like she was a very busy person, yep. but she at least has these outlets yeah. to be able to address, you know, her health and well-being and all of that. So I kind of- And she's planning a, a wedding. Maybe a little different, but- <laughs> Right. The, wedding, <laughs> the wedding the wedding would be stressful to, for me the wedding yeah. planning yeah that's just yeah. too much so it, it was just like oh my gosh you can you imagine her running around right. going crazy doing all yeah. this stuff but she she's her, her health is going to be a little better because she's eating better she's you know can bike and park and the food and all that so there's ways to remedy the stress are kind of at her fingertips but yeah. if she those social has determinants of health are also the social determinants of resilience. Yes, yes, yes. And she has the privilege of choice. That's where she is, where right. she, she mm -hmm. can choose to do away with some of the busyness. She's in a position, she's in a privileged place where she can weed some of that out if she wants. She also, so I tried to imply also that she has a family history of of eating fresh fruits and vegetables so she has a palate that is about nutritious food for her um because mom and dad are cooking with her foods from the farmer's market um and so there's a lot here a lot of um privilege a lot of um and i'm and i'm nowhere do I underestimate the effort in achieving her master's and in being able to do all those these things um but she has the privilege of choice and that is the essence of social determinants of health that and I, go ahead and i think too showing that uh again with uh lucy that accessibility you know having the access to all of these things uh 
the educational component, the uh, envir her her environment, the neighborhood, um, you know, the food, the proper food. So just all of those things, being able to have access to those, uh, and again with those choices, being able to you know build up to make those choices. And I think e even for me, it, on my plate with, uh, growing up, it was what would stretch. You know, so you, you might not have had all the best of fruits, fresh fruits and vegetables because you took a $20, $20 budget and you had to feed three kids for a whole week. So it wasn't always the healthiest choices. And so growing up, I, I'm just now getting to a point where I'm mindful of the low sodium intake. I'm mindful of, hey, you, you got to watch your uh, cholesterol. You got all these things because now I'm older. But if I went on what was based off of my experience through childhood, it would be all those heavy, quick to do things that could feed a, a nice sized family with limited resources. Right, right. Um, so you guys, all of you, thank you so much for your participation. We still have some more content to cover, but I wanna explore this space because it's a question that's been asked quite a bit in an exploration in, um, a lot of webinars. So um, the Indianapolis um, Recorder has done a lot of webinars. Um, uh, JCRC has been exploring the impact of COVID on uh, minority neighborhoods, particularly African American neighborhoods. And so um, as we just have explored a reason or a handful of reasons why African American communities are impacted more dramatically by COVID than um, majority or white neighborhoods. Um, and the social determinants, lack of investment, um, historical racism, um, systems of community development that have led to gentrification, redlining, um, uh, uh, unfair lending practices, um, all of those, so we're talking about physical stuff, but I just mentioned some things that are systems that exist that prevent um, an individual who has the greatest desire, the greatest uh, intention, who lacks the freedom to choose, like w because of their surroundings and the systems that exist to prevent personal uh, growth and, and, and achieving personal potential. And so it is, uh, you know, why is this happening? We're exploring a big piece of why it's happening, why African American and Latinx residents experience higher incidence of um, chronic disease, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, why are they dying younger um, and living, having higher uh, morbidity uh, rates, so the quality of life. Um, Indiana is one of the top five states for amputations related to diabetes. So if you have lost a limb related to your chronic disease and diabetes is incredibly prevalent in African-American and Latinx neighborhoods, the likelihood of experiencing an amputation related to it because of your environment um, absolutely should be one of the most frustrating things. And then to be more vulnerable and susceptible and more likely to die because of our current crisis situation um, is, should cause all of us to have tremendous concern and grieve deeply. So the solution to it is not, it's very complex. Um, and so we're gonna dive into that just a little bit. And this is where we're gonna shift a little bit into what LISC does and what is community development because I see the work that all of you are doing um, is community development. You're community builders in the work that you're doing. Um, I don't, Rhonda, are you still on here? Sorry. Um, Rhonda actually is one of LISC's funded partners in, in a couple of the roles that she wears like 25 different hats anyway. <laughs> um, so, so she's a community builder, you all are community builders doing community development. So it's all connected. Why is health important in community development? So comprehensive community development is the community health agenda. Housing is health, we explored. Employment is health, neighborhood safety is health. Thriving businesses and districts lead to health benefit. So my job as, as social determinants of health officer, as LIST goes to make an investment in a particular area 
of, of the social determinants is to wear this lens on applying a health lens to the development. So it doesn't require new programming, only new ways of thinking, new ways of talking about it, new partners and measuring how the impact of on our work. And so I always, am, my job is to ask the question, how will this improve um, health equity and decrease the inequities that exist in our focus um, community? So community developers have, um, have the know-how to transform neighborhoods. So I'm telling each of you, you have the know-how how to transform neighborhoods with your project. It is, it is a piece to that puzzle, improving what those in public health call the social determinants. And then what is community development? So a more formalized um, role in community development is a process for community members. We come together to take collective action and generate solutions to common problems. And then we also, it, it encompasses a range of efforts to improve physical, economic, and those social determinants, right? Um, and then also um, community development includes intentional collective action so it can't be done because, because the challenges that exist in disinvested neighborhoods, none of it could be solved by public health. None of it be, could be solved by education. It all can't be solved by community development. It is a, required a collection act, action. It requires the city. It requires policymakers. It requires education technology to come together and to preserve valuable aspects of the culture. So remember we talked about cultural humility, the neighborhood's right to preserve their own DNA in a particular geographic area. So like I said, we don't do citywide initiatives, we do specific. So how do we do this? We start at the top of the circle. We create a community collaboration team. So you guys have kind of done that. You guys are coming together in a collaborative, um, trying to, how do we move the needle in access to food and food related um, projects uh, in our city? We broaden city uh, civic engagement. So it's not just the decision makers um, at the city county building who are engaged. Um, it is the residents who are engaging. And then identify community assets. So part of the funding that we do for the neighborhoods is that someone will go around and do asset mapping. We develop a community vision. Again, this is not LISC deciding for a neighborhood. This is a group of neighborhood residents that are this collaborative team deciding their vision for their own neighborhood. They create a community plan. And if we have time, we'll, um, I'll pull one of those up so we can flip through it quickly. And then implementing the plan. So each of the goals in that plan has um, a community partner that's assigned to continue to drive that um, goal forward. And then evaluate and measure success. So did we do what we plan to do? And if we haven't, what kept us from doing it and what resources do we need to move forward in that goal and then we adjust and regroup and reassess and we begin again so over and over again because community development does not happen overnight it is a long process many times um, public health is addressed from a program level and, and you might have some incremental changes but if you want lasting change that economic, social, and built environment is where you're going to have long lasting change in health outcomes. So we build economically resilient and healthy neighborhoods. This is part of our strategic plan. Um, as I shared, LISC is a national organization. We are a community development financial institution. This is all boring information. What we talked about was actually more interesting. So I'm gonna flip through this stuff. Um, who we are is as interesting as the work that we get to do with each of you. So I don't wanna spend a ton of time on LISC because this isn't really about LISC, but it is about community development and that we are an integral partner to health equity. So in this discussion, what do we do about these situations? What do we do about uh, more chronic disease in certain neighborhoods? this comprehensive approach to community development is a piece of that work. So we're working together with partners and residents to build resiliency in neighborhoods. We provide capital technical. So here's the things that we do right here. We empower people. So any of you familiar with um, our bridges to career opportunities or centers for working families? Have any of you heard of either of those? This is the space where we help 
individuals who are looking to improve their household income by helping them become equipped with financial literacy, job coaching, connection with social supports to help them financially until they get a livable wage, sustainable living job. Um, and then any credentialing that they might need after they have that um, any job, better job, moving to that good job, any training or credentialing that they might need in order to increase their household income. And then we transform places. So with in re relationship with residents and neighbors, we are working on the preservation and construction of affordable housing. Remember, we talked about what that means and that people have are paying up to 30% of their household income um, for uh, the housing if they fall within that 30 to 80% area of median income. And then commercial, industrial, and community facilities. So um, your community uh, centers, your federally qualified health centers, um, creative placemaking, that's the arts and culture that we invest in, murals and um, entertainment, uh, uh, theater, um, transit oriented development. So as the, and what a poorly named uh, transportation system, the red line comes through Indianapolis. Um, when that planning happened, you had for-profit investors going along and buying up property along that transit. And what community development does that's focusing on maintaining affordable housing is we then go in and purchase some of those to keep the for-profit developers from purchasing them. We hold them until we find a developer that's willing to build affordable housing because who lives in affordable housing? The individuals that most likely need mass transit, right? And so we're really working hard. Land control is an important piece there. And then I'm gonna skip ahead, actually community and law enforcement partnerships. So um, right now we're looking at doing a writing a proposal for a grant so that at zoning and permitting that happens at Depart Department of Metropolitan Development, you have a fire marshal that gets to decide what actually gets developed and what doesn't in order to maintain safe environments, right? So that fire doesn't break out, that kind of thing. Well, there are community uh, crime reduction infrastructure building guidelines that pre prevent crime. They're called SEPT, it's SEPTED. It's a, a credential that helps you understand what should we build in this space that would push out crime from the neighborhood. And what we are proposing is that zoning and permitting actually have a SEPTED officer that says, nope, that gas station in that neighborhood will only bring more crime because there's already four of them just like that where we have the highest hotspot of calls. We're not going to approve a gas station in that area unless the neighbors want it. And so um, we're working on a project with that. And then support on um, enterprises. So this is small business lending and coaching. And then CBO is community-based organizations capacity building. So this is where we're spending a lot of time now in response to COVID, where we are really wanting minority, immigrant, and women-owned businesses to get our grant dollars. So we just launched a small business grant for those specific populations. Um, because we believe that those larger government dollars and programs left many minority immigrant and women owned businesses out of the benefit of those government funding sources. And so actually we just launched it and immediately we were, people were crying reverse racism and we were like, we make no apologies for um, bringing additional resources to communities, geographies, and demographics that are um, historically marginalized in government response. And then we're trying to keep the nonprofits moving. So we're helping them get more financially secure with financing and funding and to develop leadership in the neighborhood too. So someone mentioned they were AmeriCorps employee. We don't do that in the Indianapolis market, but some of our other markets throughout the United States, we do that. And then this other area is our advocacy. How do we change policies and systems? We um, partner uh, with cross sectors. We're used to playing in the sandbox with everybody who has a common goal and working on um, national, state, and local levels to change policies um, that support the investment and the development of neighborhoods based upon resident input. 
And here's where we work. So we have seven quality of life areas. So um, can you guys see my cursor here? So we have these seven quality of life areas that these are plans that have been made and then our five great places. And then we have four bridges to career opportunities where we're doing um, workforce development. And then we also have um, our inclusive economic opportunity districts, districts along the North Avenue corridor or Mass Ave corridor right here. So the Circle Center Industrial um, Complex. So what are we hoping to do? Based upon the three challenges that we explored earlier, we want to improve through our investment in the strategic plan, improve life expectancy, increase economic mobility, and close the racial equity gap. This is how we're talking differently about community development. Before, this is what we would say. We plan on deploying $40 million to forge inclusive and resilient communities. And we would say, we're, our goal is to do 100 units of affordable housing, 600 jobs created, 900,000. We would, we would say, this is our work. And now we're taking a step further and we're saying, no, this is our work. This is our goal and this is how we're gonna do it. So if you look at these, these are the social determinants of health. And then we focus on our social determinants we put into four buckets, livability, opportunity, vitality, and education. So it spells love. Um, it's a great marketing piece. So love thy neighborhood. So we invest in each of these areas. Um, we have right here. So I'm gonna quickly flip through this part. We're almost finished. Um, you guys have been great. Any questions up to this point about LISC? As I told you, the organization isn't as fun and interesting as the work that we did. Crickets, awesome. Okay, so livability is the space where you all are working in your neighborhood food builder project. And so I wanna let you know what LISC is doing in order to create, um, uh, uh, um, a space where the work that you're starting actually can grow. So we're investing $2 million to increase access to fresh food, healthy eating, physical activity, and quality health care to improve the physical health and well-being of residents. So we are going to, we have two more years and we've already done some of this, finance food access points, commercial kitchens, and food production facilities support healthy eating programs. So that's that space of how do we guide the way that people eat through the programs. But the Neighborhood Food Champions um, is a space where investment um, can flow. And then this is investing in walking, biking, and waterway plans, design and in, um, the infrastructure for those, but then also collaborating with health institutions. In the past, so LISC, we function as a bank, we take public and private dollars. So public dollars would be like from HUD. Um, uh, and then private dollars would be like a Lilly Endowment Grant or Eskenazi gives us funding. We bring it together and then we invest. We don't invest in people, we invest in organizations. So we might fund a staff person at a nonprofit organization to help fulfill this. But in the past, we used to work primarily with financial institutions. That's where we got the majority of our funding that we then invested in the nonprofits. Now we have new partners in health institutions. And here's the reason why. In the past, hospitals were reimbursed based upon each time you went to the hospital or went to the clinic. Every time you went, regardless of the outcome, the insurance company would pay you the hospital, so you had astronomical increase in costs. Now, hospitals are reimbursed, it's called value-based reimbursement, that they need you to improve in order for your trip to the hospital to not be more expensive. Because if you go back before the insurance company says you should, it's on the hospital's dime. So then they started to recognize, oh, we can only influence 20% of those outcomes. We better start investing in the environment outside of these walls in order to help people be healthy in that space because otherwise we're going to end up paying for it. So unfortunately, there's a little bit of a 
selfish capitalist drive to why health institutions are now interested in community development, but it gives you a little bit of, ah, that's why we see, now I will tell you, Eskenazi is a great institution to work with. They get it and they are about outcomes, not just the bottom line for them. But there are some other institutions that we, we it's very clear, it's what do we get in return for our investment. All right, and then here we're going to invest $1 million to integrate arts and culture into beautiful spaces, build a strong sense of place and enhance neighborhood identity to improve the mental health and well being of residents. So, this is parks, programs, green spaces. Um, so, this could be the space where you do an urban garden or a green space like a pocket park, and then using public spaces. Um, to increase the use of those spaces and then neighborhood artists to lead neighborhood projects. And then we're going to partner with groups to reduce crime and enhance safety. And this is the integrate education public safety. So that's where we talked about um, residents maybe getting trained in SEPTED um, principles. So as they decide what development they want in their neighborhood, they know that they're reducing crime by using them. And then provide community financial financing for social service agencies. So um, that is who LISC is. This is what we're investing in the space where you're working with food. So do know we're super excited about that. I mentioned last week that we are looking at putting together a very large proposal that would really change the ecosystem around food access, food economy, and food insecurity um, citywide, but then also focusing on a specific neighborhood to see growth. And so you guys are a key piece to that. Um, we're excited to see. Um, you guys grow your projects and hopefully grow some passion about the work that you're doing so that you can have impact um, for residents in the neighborhoods where we focus. So what's, what's the long term? So this is how we go when we look at community development. We're working on these outputs, the one to three years. So we're going to invest, invest, invest in these areas. And then these outcomes, we're hoping to see an increased access to recreation, active living, nature and beauty and then increase access to healthy foods. And then what are these results, these health outcomes? Because we invested in the one to three years, what are we expecting to see in five to 10 years? A decrease in chronic health conditions, a reduction in emergency room visits, a reduction in re readmissions, improved physical and mental health, improved birth outcomes, and improved diabetes and cardiovascular disease management. So really community development isn't just about buildings, it's about people and their health and their equitable access to be healthy. All right, that is it. And I just bored you through that last part. Um, that's why I didn't put it first. <laughs> so um, any questions that you have, the list part, um, I love the organization, I love our mission and the work that we do. Um, for sure, um, but super excited about the work that each of you are doing and hope to bring some more funding to create a, an ecosystem for you all to thrive. Any questions or any discussion? It's, Sounds exciting. Uh, it, yes, it does. What does LIST stand for? I know it's an acronym, but yeah. you know, I'm, I'm like, can't see right now. So sure. can yeah. you tell me what it actually stands for? Yes, local initiatives support corporation so lisk is considered oh, okay. yep we are local initiative support goal in that we don't do we're not working up in lafayette or down in bloomington notice i picked purdue and iu um i'm a boilermaker um we um we work locally and we work so locally we work in neighborhood clusters right initiative so what goals do the neighborhoods have for their specific area and then support we are there for uh, technical support financial support um, cheering you on what support do you need to accomplish your goals and then corporation that's the business part of what we do thank you yeah you can go to lisk.org forward slash indianapolis and find out more about what we do Thank you so much. You're welcome. Any other questions, comments, even if they, you know, I, Rhonda knows this, I love <laughs> conversation that ruffles feathers, that pushes the envelope, that might 
I'm so okay if you say, I don't like the work that you do. I think it's been harmful, whatever. I, I, I'm open. You I want to hear it. it. <laughs> so <laughs> sometimes any, I hear it. It's all good. Any questions or, or comments? Or, I, or... I do have a question actually. So, um, as the neighborhood food champions cohort and us trying to start our projects, how can we build up more social capital for our our projects, I guess? Yeah. So I don't know what neighborhood you guys are working in. So um, actually, if I go up here, um, I can take you. So if you do go to our website, really where I would, I suggest is maybe go to our website and go what food initiatives are in plans that are already written throughout mm -hmm. the city and go, where can I connect the work I want to do in a specific neighborhood? Because if there's a group of residents already working in an area, one, it's likely to have some funding behind it, or two, they need additional help in um, that that manpower resource or somebody just to say, yeah, we wanted to improve food access or have an urban garden or production, food production facility, but we just don't have enough people to help us do it. Can you do it? So that's one thing that you can do is become familiar with what neighborhoods have food initiatives in them, and then you can connect that way. Um, another way is, so the city, um, Malele Kennedy, I don't know, is she presenting into this, this cohort? She has already. Okay. She, she so was connect, the first person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So connecting with her and saying, here's some work that I do. But I, honestly, I'm going to tell you right now, um, the woman who is leading your group has a great connection network. And so if there's a direction mm -hmm. you want to go, she probably already knows somebody or knows the email or knows who's to ask find a space for you. So um, not to give her more work, but you have one of the best city resources available to you in Rhonda Bayless. Aww. That's a great question. I will say, I think it's really important that you all connect to, like I said, the great places. I don't, you know, the QOL, the quality of life groups that are around the city, because I think what Shelby said is correct. Um, and maybe Aaron can speak to it a little bit because he does uh, help to lead up the food access committee for the near Northwest, um, which there's already a plan of, there's an action, there's work that's already been done. Um, and, you know, each year those groups come together to formulate what their goals are. Um, and that way you do have a community of folks who are doing food related projects or interested in food access, um, that you can kind of, you know, connect to is resident based so it keeps you connected to the neighborhood so that you're not just looking at you know I, you're not focusing on the east side if you're on the west side you know you need to focus on your neighborhood and your community and what that neighborhood needs so i really would start there to see if there's already work being done if there's some kind of way that you can connect with either you know a great places um group or a love committee or a quality of life uh, community that's focusing on food. Right, so I just pulled up, I don't know if you can, I hope you can see it. So this is Inglewood Village. So this is over Washington and rural um, area um, where they had in their plan to develop Washington and rural streets as destination streets. So this is the livability portion of their plan um, to encourage pedestrian activity, foster biking, they've done a great job there create a public space um, at the PR Mallory campus. So they are developing a park. Um, PR Mallory also um, has uh, Farm 360. I think it has a new name now. So it is a food processing, fruit, food growing, a greenhouse processing plant um, that was part of that. And then establish a neighborhood health center. They haven't done that yet. Increase crime uh, prevention opportunities for neighborhoods and business and then upgrade Indigo's route um, eight to model. So the future rapid uh, transit line, they've done that too. So this is the very abbreviated version. There's more details into what they want to do around food in the Near East Quality of Life Plan has a lot of food mm -hmm. initiatives in it. Mm -hmm. And so 
even going to the quality of life links on our web page and then looking mm -hmm. at what their plans are is a really great way to become familiar but do know that there's more coming down the pipeline um, food used to be kind of centralized and coordinated through the Indy Food Council, which mm -hmm. initially started at LISC and it was a collective mm -hmm. impact and kind of dissipated. It is coming back together, not necessarily as the Indy Food Council, but the Food Trust and Jump In for Healthy Kids in the city. Um, so there's a, a group coming back together and then there's some new players and in investment um, that I kind of alluded to um, in health institutions that really want to invest in this area. So you guys are in a sweet spot the city has identified food as an area of investment and new market tax credits, which might mean nothing to you, or CDBG dollars, but um, small entrepreneur businesses, you guys are really in a sweet spot to be building something great for your community and for yourself as individuals. Any other questions or comments or? No? Will awesome. Shelby? Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. It was no, I, such a joy to be with you all. I always enjoy listening to you talk about um, what's happening in, the, in Indianapolis and in the neighborhoods. And please take all of this information, um, piece it apart, dissect it, figure out how it's going to work within your food projects, how you can make sure that you're always thinking about the social determinants of health. Um, this is the way public health is even going. So it's not just, it's not community development versus public health. This is how public health kind of thought about it, but in a different way. But all, all sectors of health is thinking about it in these um, where, you know, work, play, and live kind of uh, spaces. So we really want to make sure that you guys think about this. Something that I do want to say also is that sometimes when we're coming to work with our passion first, that we think because we represent a community, sometimes you got to make sure that you're also listening to experiences, right? So it's not that I am Black, female, middle-aged woman, and I see somebody who I think is just like me, I still need to have that conversation to have, uh, to validate her experiences and so that I can empower her um, in the direction she wants to take. You guys need to make sure that you're doing that when you're working with folks and not just kind of assuming that you look like the community that you're walking in, that you necessarily, one, are, not, are the best person for her for those kind of conversations, but that you have a clear understanding of those experiences. My experiences aren't everybody else's. And so I really want that part to come come out because I think sometimes people we get caught up in our passion and we don't have conversation. And so really to have conversations with the communities that you're working with. Um, next week we will have Dr. Staten from IPUI. And so she's gonna start talking to you about grant writing. Um, I will via email kind of ask questions about uh, Danielle Patterson wants to come back of course and do more around advocacy. Um, and I wanted to see if you guys wanna continue on a Thursday or have that as a supplemental uh, workshop. So we'll ask that. And then Mary County Health Department coming back and doing a supplemental workshop around nutrition. Uh, but I'll ask that question via email. It's 8.02. Go enjoy yourself. <laughs> Have a good hey, evening. Thank you. Thank so you all. Good. We'll see you next week, okay? And find these thank other you. people. We're Goodbye. missing about Bye. six people. Find them. All right. All right. Yes. Yes, Rhonda. All right. Thank see you, you later. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye.